Great. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Harper. I'm the Associate Dean for Inclusion, Engagement, and International Affairs at Pitt Business, and I'm happy to welcome you to Making Our Milestones More Meaningful, the Pitt Business 2024 Black History Month uh, Center event. And it's very, it's, it's, it's an honor uh, this year to be able to organize our event around a distinguished alumnus of, this, of the business school and of the university, uh, and also use this as an opportunity to think about and capture the important history that Pitt Business has had in influencing thought within management uh, and in business practice around the relationship between business and society. We have a very distinguished uh, group of moderators. We have a distinguished group of uh, alums that will be participating in the program for today. Um, just to go over the agenda quickly, and then I, then I want to move towards um, uh, uh, recognizing people that are in the room, but just to, to recognize, or at least to go over the agenda a bit. So we'll have a keynote luncheon, which is really an opportunity to hear quite a bit more of what I came to learn about, which is Dr. Tita's uh, personal history, but how that's really implicated in the history of the business school and a lot of the things that we currently do now, right? So I think that th this was one of the things that I learned about as I got a chance to meet him this fall when we were actually celebrating an another distinguished alumna of the, of, uh, the Cat School of Business, Ambassador Masagoa Masir Mwamba, okay? And so that'll be our first part is the luncheon. Um, there will also be a, a, a second um, uh, piece that's on the discussion of art and of the art of diplomacy. So I hope people will stick around. I think that that gives us an opportunity to unpack a very important part of Dr. Tita's professional experience and biography. Uh, and then the third, uh, the third panel that we'll have today is stu the, from student activist to business advocate. Uh, and I, and this was a very important um, addition, I think, to the schedule given a lot of the kind of the righteous energies that emanate from our campus and come to our campus uh, to make sure that we have a productive dialogue about how to use and, and use those energies in ways that move society forward and how business in particular can participate in that process. Uh, at this time, I'd actually like to welcome our Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Clyde Pickett, for additional welcoming remarks. Thank you. Well, greetings. It's good to be with you. As was shared, I'm Clyde Wilson Pickett. I serve as the university's vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion, and chief diversity officer. Certainly on behalf of all of my colleagues here at the university, including Chancellor Gable, it's uh, a privilege to be with you and certainly a privilege to be in the company of Dr. Tita. Certainly, we, we thank you for all that you've done and um, made possible in your work and time with us here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we had an opportunity last night to spend some time with, with Dr. Tita and others who were a part uh, of our community and blazed a trail in many ways for the reality of an Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. We are reminded that we stand on the shoulders of many who made it possible for us to be here. And their legacy is critical in us thinking about not only our observance of Black History Month, but the ways in which we continue to advance the work to make the university more uh, inclusive and more equitable for all. And so on behalf of, of all of my colleagues, certainly it's an honor and privilege to be with you. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Certainly we're in the midst as a university of observing the year of discourse and dialogue and certainly the art of diplomacy and the ways in which we think about diplomacy being a critical resource and tool to have dialogue and exchange is an important part of how we continue to advance and, and create an environment of learning. And so excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Hopper, for the opportunity to, to allow me to, to be here today and for creating this for our community. So looking forward to all that will come in the time ahead. Thank you and be well. Thank you. And thank you so much for that reminder, too, about um, the importance of the shoulders that we stand on. I've been kind of preaching as I've moved into this new position uh, in the associate deanship, uh, the importance uh, that I've found of recognizing the important work that's happened uh, before I came. A lot, of the, a lot of the ideas that I thought or that I was floating and thought were fresh, 
I came to find out that these two gentlemen <laughs> had already made attempts and had lots of success around that. And so this is there's a great way that we're bringing it all together here. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, recognize uh, some uh, individuals that are that have joined us online and also in person. Uh, at some risk, I'm sure. There's a, so uh, when, whenever you identify people by uh, uh, individuals, um, uh, there's always the possibility that I might leave somebody off. So I just want to make sure that uh, uh, I recognize that. Uh, but uh, Bibi Boerio, our chair for Pitt uh, Board of Visitors. Um, we've got uh, Sammy Thompson, from uh, uh, who's also a member of our Board of Visitors at Pitt Business, class of 1970, Gloucester Current who's the founder of P-Band, which is our Pitt, Pitt Black, uh, or Pitt Black uh, Alumni Network, class of 1971. Morris Fountain is here to join us today, uh, class of 1970. We have Doug McCullough, who's uh, Vice Chancellor for Individual Gifts, joining us, uh, down to Alicia Deans. I just had the pleasure of meeting, who just joined uh, as director of, uh, joined his office as Director of Development for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Uh, John Tyler, founder and board chair for the Intercultural House, uh, and a lot of their alumni are here. Uh, um, Dr. Pickett actually mentioned that there was a great event uh, last evening, and so there was a reunion that was structured around this by the Intercultural House, and so I was glad to be able to join that too. Uh, and welcome to their alumni who are here. Um, Carlton, St Carlton Scott, the executive director of the Intercultural House. Uh, Dr. Millie Myers. A uh, close family friend of mine and, uh, and widow of past Pitt uh, Dean, William Frederick. I'm so happy that you're here and somebody who made my travel into this city uh, and inclusion into this city much better than it would have been otherwise. So I'm so happy that you're able to join us. Um, I do want to recognize uh, any Pitt business uh, students and faculty. Uh, I do want to have, uh, I do want to mention Dr. Barry Mitnick, who's been fighting the good fight on this faculty for business and society for a long time. Uh, Barry, we're, I, I'm pretty sure I saw you. Can you put your hand up there? There's Barry. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here, Barry. Uh, and Dr. Da David LaBelle. Um, Dave, I, I, I want to mention Dave, um, because after the murder of George Floyd, our university and our school uh, was wrestling with what we should be doing and what our path should be forward. Uh, and under his leadership, our entire faculty went through a series of trainings to receive the certificate uh, and EDI and inclusion. And that's not something Pitt just gives away, right? So I haven't had a chance, Dave, to, to thank you. So I'm choosing this moment to thank you publicly. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dave. Can you wave your hand so people know who you are? Thanks, Dave. Um, and uh, I, I see Associate Dean for Pitt Business, Becky Badawi there, who uh, joined at the same time I did in the leadership. Uh, and online, I think Kath Catherine Co Covarola, the Interim Director of the Center for African Studies, uh, she should be joining too. And so, uh, so these are folks who have been very instrumental in the events that we have today and the plans that we have in moving this energy forward. Uh, at this time, please let me introduce Clarence Curry, class of 1971, who's actually on the stage, but I'll invite you to come up to uh, the, uh, the podium. Uh, you have biographies of all of our moderators on the back of your program, but let me read Clarence for you, for the, re read your biography into the record here. <laughs> so Clarence Curry has been actively involved in economic development, marketing, planning, and advocacy for small and minority businesses for over 40 years. He served on the faculty of the Katz Graduate School of Business University of Pittsburgh for 25 years, where he taught statistics, marketing, and entrepreneurship. He has also taught management classes at Cal U and uh, the Center for Urban and Biblical Ministries at Geneva College. During his tenure at the University of Pittsburgh, he founded and managed the Small Business Development Center and the Advanced Technology Entrepreneurial Center, both of which are still operating here. Those programs were instrumental in the startup and growth of over a thousand small and mid-sized firms. Services provided to those firms included formulation of business plans, funding for loans and grants, as well as certification for MBE and WBE status. His academic training includes a BS degree in metallurgical engineering from Lafayette College, an MBA from University of Pittsburgh, and an uh, MSIA from the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon. Please help me welcome Clarence Curry to the podium. Good morning. 
Uh, I want to thank Dr. Harper for initiating this program, which gives us an opportunity to kind of document some of the history that uh, black and women individuals have played in, in transforming and broadening the horizon of the prison school. Uh, as director of equity and inclusion for the, for the, as the first director of equity and inclusion for the business school, it's fitting and proper that you would be the one to undertake this effort. Uh, what I want to try to do is to develop a historical context about the time period starting in uh, 1969 when uh, Bill found his way to Pittsburgh and develop a framework so that Bill can then just take a deep dive into the issues that are most important to him. Uh, I want to call your attention to the uh, introductory uh, literature that was sent out to promote the program. And the first sentence there uh, reads as follows. When Dr. Tita arrived at, Ka at Cass in 1969, the remnants of racial segregation continued to mark social and economic relationship in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, yes, things were bad in 1969. And yes, we made some progress but we still have a, lot, a long way to go. Uh, if we look at, and I taught statistics, if we look at income, the median income in 1970 for everyone in the country was $55,000. Median income family for black families was 35,000. If we jump forward to 50 years to 2020, the gap persists, the actual percentage uh, gap between uh, minority, between black folks and the overall population. It, the gap has been closed a little bit. It's gone from 65% uh, for blacks in 1970 to about 70% now. Uh, some other highlights of that time period. Uh, first, going back a little before 1970, uh, Pittsburgh suffered from the displacement of 8,000 residents from the Lower Hill, when in the name of redevelopment, uh, about a third of the Hill District was demolished. Uh, we're still trying to recover from that. And I've, I've been involved until very recently into the Lower Hill Development Project, which is restoring 28 acres, which was the site of the former arena and the first building going up on that site F&B Towers is going to be opening very soon. Also, during that same time period, the Center for Race and Social Problems at the School of Social Work here at Pitt has run a series of studies documenting uh, the role of race in the development of Western, Southwestern Pennsylvania. And they have produced a litany of studies comparing Pittsburgh to other cities, which show uh, that Pittsburgh region ranks at the bottom in comparative similar cities uh, in a variety of dimensions related to economics, health, and education. The University of Pittsburgh went through its own crisis in 1968 after Martin Luther King was killed, uh, which began with a series of violent uh, demonstrations, primarily in, in, the, in the Hill District and in Homewood. But we had, a, and, and Morris and I were talking about this before we started tonight. We had our own many seeds here at the University of Pittsburgh back in the good old days when there was a single mainframe computer that controlled the whole university. And black students took over that, that computer. Uh, they also forced uh, Wesley Posbar, the chancellor then at that time period, to put a secret escape door into his office so the students could no longer lock him <laughs> in his office. Uh, as a result of, of the demands for the students, the students' demands primarily were, were for more students, more support for students, more black faculty, and also for the creation of the, uh, of the black studies department. The business school, in response to to this created their own affirmative action program, which led in 1970 to the enrollment of six African-American students. 
That included Morris Fountain, who was here with us today, Sammy Thompson, who I think is, is on Zoom with us, and Dr. William Tigatita. Uh, they also, at that time period, we employed our first black faculty person, Dr. Alex Williams, and uh, we had a minority recruiter, Bill Kendall, who also became a good friend of mine. I came along the next year into the class of 71. So I came to campus in the fall of uh, 1970, and along with 17 other minority students. Uh, Bill and I met very early on that semester, and we became close friends, and we've been we've stayed friends for the for the uh, last fifty years. Uh, at this time period, there was also the expansion of two new academic disciplines related to business. The first was entrepreneurship. The second was business and society. And the business and society was led not only just at, at Pittsburgh, but also nationally by Dr. William Frederick. And his widow is here with us today. And one of, Bill, one of Dr. Frederick's favorite students was Dr. William Tito. The other issue that I want to stress is that Pittsburgh ran a grand experiment at the business school. So between 1970 and 1975, the University of Pittsburgh granted MBA degrees to at least 75 minority students. Um, some of us have personally tried to track that success. And also Terry Collier is with us today, who was in my class uh, of the second group. Almost all of those students graduated. There were two, at least, the, there was, a quite a bit of diversity among those minority students. There were a few of us who had attended good white schools and who had reasonable test scores. And we were kind of considered like the, the regular admits. We were the ones who would have probably been able to get in without the affirmative action program. But I wanna stress is that almost all of those students who had a wide range of GMAT, GMAT scores, which I think has been the big boogie bear, which has prevented a lot of current applicants from enrolling in the business school. I don't think we've done as much as we could to look at the success of those students and to use that database to help us formulate some reasonable admission and, and recruitment policies in terms of which SB, HBCUs graduate the best students, and I don't want to go into that at this point, but, but there are a range of HBCUs, just like there's a range of, of uh, white schools. The other thing is how did the minority students impact the faculty and the other things that were going, around, going on around Pittsburgh? I remember the required, one of the required readings in my business and society class was the autobiography of Malcolm X. So think about what the student interaction would have been in an all white group versus what it was like when we had minority students who had, whose opinions at least had to be respected by, the, by most of the students and some of the faculty. Uh, there are other questions. Uh, how did the faculty perceive us? Was the program a success? What did this experiment tell us about bringing a minority students into a previously all white environment? And how should that experience impact what we need to do moving forward given the recent Supreme Court rulings about affirmative action? And now I'm gonna turn the, for, the, form over, the format over to Dr. Tita with a word from the black church. Brother Tita, teach. Brother Tita, preach. This is the slide here.
Well, good morning. Well, good morning. <laughs> First, Paul had told me I had between 11 o'clock and 1.30 to speak because he had heard rumors that I could talk like Castro for 27 hours. Then when he found out a little bit more, he started reducing it. And now I got, I think, 20 minutes, <laughs> which is okay. Let me only start, first of all, by thanking you and uh, for being here. And to say something that I always tell my students. I've been teaching since, I think, 1969, really. So when you add and subtract, it's more than 50 years. And uh, some of you read my bio. I was born in Jos, Nigeria. I grew up in Cameroon. I went to school at Duke. <clears throat> I came to Pitt. And I don't even want to talk about the no number of languages that I speak, but I do understand a whole lot of languages. And I tell my students, if you don't hear what I say, you don't understand what I said, I'll always tell them, nothing is wrong with your ears. I have an accent that is a mixture of all of these languages. So no apologies, no apologies for telling me to repeat what I said or for asking me a question to clarify what I said. Uh, you will not get that kind of apology from me, and I don't expect any from you. But we know the American way. Professor, uh, did you actually say something that might be on the test? <laughs> <laughs> now you know he or she didn't hear what you said, but they want to know whether it's going to be on the test. <laughs> so that's, <clears throat> that's one thing that I must confess. The other thing, some of you read my name, William Tiga Tita. I know people that prefer to call me Tiga, like John, John Tallow. He has told me many times of all the names you have. I just want to call you Tiga. I don't want to embarrass him by what Tiga means, but I've allowed him carry the day. So he calls me Tiga. Uh, other people call me William. Uh, most of the people call me Bill. I try to disabuse people from calling me Bill. But when I got to the States, we used to write letters. People don't write letters anymore. And um, I went to Putney, Vermont, uh, Center for International or Intercultural Experience. And, so, and I wrote a letter back to my father and I signed it, Bill. My father responded with an 18-page letter to explain to me how I got the name William. And William was given to me by my uncle. It's actually a German name, William. And uh, he walked days to where I was born to make sure that I was named William. And my father just did not entertain the idea of telling him my name was Bill. So I never used that word again. Then I wanted people to call me Tita. Some of you who teach, one of the no-no's for students is to come and call you by your last name as they read the syllabus. So they come with Professor Tita, Dr. Tita, they really don't want to call you Tita. And I say, please call me Tita, and all eyes are raised. But then in those early days, people did not want to call me Tita, so they called me Tito. And now, those of you that were around in the 60s, 
There was Tito of Yugoslavia. He was a short man, like the Francisco from Spain and um, Hitler from Germany, but his name was Tito. And uh, I decided if you want to call me Tito, I'll accept it. And I did. But then, even though John calls me Tiga, and I appreciate it, a lot of people just decided to call me Tiger. That name preceded me before I went to parties. And I'll go to parties, and young ladies come with me, and Tiger, I, Lord, I must, I felt comfortable. <laughs> but I did not quite think my name was Tiger. So what's in the name? A lot of things, and we need to think about it. And uh, I took it for what it is worth. So there's an evolution of my name. And uh, I would not belabor the point, but whatever you decide to call me, like some comedian used to say, just call me something. <laughs> I will accept it. Now, I want to get a few things out of the way before I make my three hour presentation. <laughs> and uh, first I want to thank my friends, family that have traveled distances to be here uh, today to celebrate this day with me and with all of us. So let me just start by saying those friends of mine who went to school with me at Pitt, those that joined us at the Intercultural House, my wife and I were their parents during that period. Will you just please stand up for a minute and be recognized? Friends from school and those in the Intercultural House. There are some other friends that joined me in the student consulting project. I will talk about it during the presentation. And those are friends who decided to join me and for us to leave the Cathedral of Learning. And some of you may know uh, that there were some friends in neighboring universities that called the Cathedral of Learning, not the Cathedral of Learning. Um, I will leave whatever name they call us alone for a minute. I also would like to mention that when you got a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, from the Cathedral or something, in Pittsburgh, when you were congratulated for having earned a PhD, it wasn't no doctor of philosophy. It was you have stayed in Pittsburgh, and you were in the 60s, you know what it was. During the winter, we had nothing but potholes around here until it was election, and the mayor would put some black top on top of it. And right after that, there would be another rainfall or snow, and we were back to potholes. Remember the, the, the streets? There were streetcars that went up and down Fifth and Forbes Avenue. So in any, in any case, when you got a PhD here, you had actually earned what we call the pothole dodger. So that's what we were when you got a PhD from here. And um, that was an honor, it was a batch of honor, because I can drive through potholes. And uh, where I come from, potholes are part of the road infrastructure. And I can be very good at doing that. Now, we also went to the communities and my good friend Clarence taught statistics. And he's a mathematician and he deals with numbers and 
relationships. Some of you know about correlation analysis. Some of you know about factor analysis. Some of you know about regression analysis. Oh, Clarence can talk that out. And Pitt was just the place for him. Well, I don't talk numbers. Yes, I graduated from Duke in mechanical engineering and so on and so forth. But my game is not about numbers. It's about relationships. When I look at people, I look at the relationship between them. I don't look at numbers. And that is my focus. So I appreciate my friend Clarence, who can talk about income differences and how it has changed and uh, all of the things that define significance and all of those things. And he compliments some of us a whole lot. And I listen to him carefully because when I contextualize what he is saying, I'm talking about people, not numbers. And, uh, and that's a good thing. We've been friends 50 something years and I listen to what he has to say and I put it in my own world and that's important. Now, I just want to say one thing about a good young man, Richard Walkers, he's sitting right there. And I would have loved to introduce this young man. He was not only my student assistant, and uh, he went with me into the community. And uh, during the time when we were assigning people into the community, Richard was one of those people we sent to the north side to work with a businessman. And Richard went there to do consulting. And he got there, his task was to do some inventory control and use the inventory control model from the business school to make sure that this business person got to know about reorder points. Some of you know about reorder points and so on and so forth. So he went there to do the physical count of the inventory. He went there. And when he came back, all I said, um, there had been a flood. And uh, when he went there, all of the inventory was underwater. And so he had nothing to count. But he wanted to know how do you account for that because he found out first the business person didn't have any hazard insurance. So without any hazard insurance, flooding was not accounted for. So you could take that zero. And we couldn't get Professor Rossell to tell us how rich should account for that inventory control that never happened. Then he found out when he went back, I guess, on a Monday, that the business person had also had some fire issues. There was the place that burned down also. And so he scratched his head. And then in talking to the business person, found out the business person had fire insurance. Now the question was, does he account for the inventory loss due to flood which, where there was no insurance? Or does he account for the inventory loss due to fire because the business person had fire insurance? Now, for those of you that don't think that's an ethical issue, <laughs> it is an ethical issue. And uh, Rich can talk about the rest of the story, but we booked it on the file hazard. And the business person got insurance policy that covered that. And so the business person was able to replenish their inventory. Uh, based on a decision that on the surface was unethical, but it did solve the problem of the business person. Richard is here. He's been a chair professor at the University of Virginia, a renowned professor at Virginia Tech. Thanks for reminding me about that. But what I do know about Richard is not his accomplishment ac academically, which is fantastic. But the man who went to Northside and got a business person 
and their family to live another year under their roof. So thank you, Richard. <laughs> and that was the student consulting project. Students went out there not to change the world, but to manage what was happening one person at a time. And we'll talk about that. And for that, we are most appreciative. Now, for those of you who were with the intercultural house, do we have any intercultural house folks here? We were with them last night. Okay, Richard was there too and so on. Rosemary and Tim. Uh, it's been a long journey, but I'll just say one word. The intercultural house was a dream an experiment meant to fail. Pasver, himself the chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh, knew it was going to fail. He did follow it, and it has been around. Uh, the physical structure where 20, 24 students staying, and my wife and I were honored to be the first father and mother of that house, still existed until some developers came and had a better idea for the place. Now, the supporters of the intercultural house, John Tyler and his wife, Gabriel, uh, were gracious as now then to help us live through that period. I won't make it personal, but my wife and I appreciated having the ability to stay in the intercultural house. John is here with us today. And last night, for those of you who were not there, the dream of the intercultural house, the vision of the intercultural house, which was to have black and white students, basically, to live with each other in the same room for more than six hours was a dream. Now, I did say last night, we walked it, we stayed there. Now, some of you might not even think about what it meant in 1969 to have a white student and a black student live in the same room go to the bathroom in the same room. It was a risk for which the university did not want to take an insurance policy. And Possible externalized that cost by saying, if you stayed there, that means if you were a student, white or black, and you came and dared to stay in the intercultural house, Possible guarantee you full tuition for your stay at the University of Pittsburgh. So all of our students got full scholarship to be at the University of Pittsburgh. In addition to having free room and board, and uh, as John will reveal to us, the director of food services at the University of Pittsburgh decided if that was going to happen, he would donate food he would cater food for all of those students from the university for the year. And so the students had free food, free room and board, and free scholarship. And then, of course, John and Gabriel, through the Get to Sam Foundation, provided them money so we could have Friday night parties, and then eventually went anywhere in the world that they could go to to work. And they went to Ghana and built a maternity uh, house and went somewhere else and built a school. So they traveled together. So they did not only experience each other on different street, but they experienced each other outside of the United States. And it was quite an experience for those students. That was 1969. And as John would say it, that whole thinking about black-white relationship has gone through ups and downs to the point where Washington and the Supreme Court 
have come out with rulings that has threatened the fabric of black-white relationships at universities. Some of you know about this. Scholarships for black students, scholarships, for, it, it is chaos. And I, I, I take my hat off to university administrators because navigating through all of that nightmare is not easy. So students from poor families, reflected by the kind of statistics that Clarence was talking about, are having a challenge of their own. The university who is committed to helping poor students from black communities and white communities are having a challenge. And trying to figure out how to add these things together has become a nightmare for all universities. So when last night, John, indicated and suggested that that vision of bringing black and white together within the context of the university is still an important vision. Maybe not totally realized, but it's still an important vision. I thought it was great and I would just love to recognize John because in the goodness of him, the foundation has committed $300,000 to continue for this dream to be realized at the University of Pittsburgh. And Paul, and Paul, and Carlton are mandated to drive this process, respecting the integrity of the vision. And we are hoping that the university would stand tall and continue to make sure that they allow the setting of the University of Pittsburgh to be a place where black and white can feel free to realize their ambitions. So I would love for us to recognize John Tyler. Here's John. John is a man of two words, so I wouldn't put him in the embarrassing situation of making a speech. But those of us that are going to be here, you can meet John. And uh, he made a long speech last night, so we'll spare him the trouble of repeating himself. But like they say, actions speak louder than words. And his actions have spoken. And the university would have to take it from there. And our Paul Barrows, Paul, and Scott Carlton, you have the charge. And we will hold you accountable when it doesn't happen. <laughs> we will be with you in spirit to help you in any way that we can. Thank you on that. Now, I'm through thanking everybody. Again, let me end that piece of thank you note. Again, thank my partner, my spouse, my wife, Bernice, who, as a matter of fact, we were married one month when we came to Pittsburgh. And we were married three, four months when she was thrust to living with 24 wolves in a lion den. And she was the only female at that time in the intercultural house. How she survived, I don't know, but did she, <laughs> did she survive? She did. So thank you, Bernice. Now, I will make 
now on short presentation around three things, and you would say that going forward. I just want to start by saying that uh, this particular honor by the University of Pittsburgh <coughs> is a great milestone, a great moment for me to just pause for a minute and reflect on the stepping stones, I call it stepping stones, that have paved the way in my life. All of us have matured on the backs of somebody. And my stepping stones, as I reflect on it, have accounted for where I am and where I want to go. Now, each of the stepping stones represent two things. One is a lesson. Somebody was trying to teach me something. Did I get it immediately? No. Eventually, I got it. And I want to share with you the lessons I learned with these stepping stones. Not because I got it when they were trying to teach me, but because upon reflection, I got to see what they were trying to get me to understand. Then I want to, where I can, share with you the people who were gracious enough to provide me with that wisdom. You will see some of their pictures. So I will tell you about the stepping stone. I'll tell you about what I got out of it after reflection. And you will see some of those faces. I'm doing this <laughs> simply because I just don't think I should share my stepping stones with you. But I want to call your attention to the fact that all of us individually have stepping stones. And I want to challenge you to think about your own stepping stones, to reflect on the wisdom and the lessons that folks were trying to get you to appreciate. And to hope that out of this, you can benefit from <coughs> the, the life history that you have been part of. So I give you my story, but I give you my story because I want you to reflect on your own story. I want you to think about where you have come from, where you are, and where you are going. I think I know a little bit about mine, and that's why I want to share it with you. So my presentation this morning has to do where's my IT person? Okay. Do I just yeah? Good, good. Okay. So this is about my stepping stones. I divided into little segments. The early stepping stones. And jumping into the real world, quote unquote. And then running with the lessons that I learned from these stepping stones. Now, these stepping stones <coughs> constitute what I call the influences in my life. 
And the lessons I learned going through this, the first one starting with the foundational value, I call it value number one. And that came from my grandfather. That is my grandfather. He is at the top. That is my grandfather with a young lady. Who would guess who the young lady is? That's my wife. Now, my grandfather met this young lady when I took her in 1970. That's 53, 55 years ago. For him to meet the woman that I'd chosen to get married to when I had finished my degree at Duke. And that's my grandfather with that young lady who is sitting right there 55 years ago. Now, I want to tell you about my grandfather and lesson number one. When we went home in 1970, I had gotten a bachelor's degree from Duke in mechanical engineering. I'd gotten a master's degree in business from Pitt. I was married. And when I got home, like all good kids that have succeeded. I wanted my grandfather not only to be proud of who I was, but I wanted to show my grandfather how appreciative I was for having grown with him. And so I landed in the capital city I made sure I bought a big, big bottle of snacks. Some of you may not know about snacks, but it would be the high-grade whiskey that you can think about. And I took this bottle of snacks to the village where my grandfather was. And I gave this bottle of snacks to my grandfather with all the pride, with all the expectations of thank you. My grandfather thanked me. He appreciated that I'd given him that gift. But my grandfather always had an entourage around him in the evening. And I watched my grandfather open up this bottle of snaps and pass it around. And I watch those people not only appreciate what they saw, they drank with all kinds of joy. And I watch that bottle of snap go down and down and down. And Lord have mercy, they finished that bottle of snap. I want to let you know there was one person that did not appreciate that. I was pissed. And when I left, we're going to go back to the city where we were going to go and go to the nightclub and so on. I walked a little bit. I came back and called my grandfather on this side. And I said, Grandfather, I did not mean to bring this expensive whiskey for you to share with, you, you know what my thinking was. This no good folks that come by all the time. 
to eat where they haven't shown, to drink where they did not even contribute a dime to my... I, I told my grandfather that. It was meant for you. And I want you to know, for the first time, and I grew up with my grandparents, the countenance, facial expression on my grandfather's face changed. He became really mad. He became very bitter. And as I looked at him, get angrier and angrier, he told me, he said, son, if you think you brought the whiskey so I could drink it and look, I beg you, I plead with you, don't bring any whiskey to me anymore. As a matter of fact, bring me no gift today. And I got the message. My grandfather was angry. I left and went to the city to enjoy myself on my the, the air and the nightclub. But thank God I had an opportunity to go back to my grandfather's village to tell him goodbye that I was getting ready to go back to the United States. And upon reflection as to what I had done wrong, because my grandfather had never been angry with me. I consulted with my grandmother and what I understood was that my grandfather in rejoicing my success had to rejoice it with the people that made him who he was. My grandfather enjoyed his life by the people that came by every evening and shared stories with him and ate with him. And it was important for me to understand that my grandfather was trying to teach me something. That is the communitarian value. Communitarian value. The Ubuntu value. For those of you, the MBA program, or you've taken courses in what's the difference between the work group in Argentina and the work group in South Africa and the work group in the United States, there are four or five values that Hofstede identified that differentiated between groups in different countries. And later on, he found out he should add another one to it, which was Confucius. And later on, they've added the Ubuntu, where the relationship between the supervisor and the employee in Confucius is very different from the relationship between a superior and, and a, 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 a member of the group in the US. And Ubuntu and the communitarian body is very different from what we are used to here in the United States. So succeeding in managing a group, succeeding in managing a community, in the village were not based on the same values that I had learned so well in the MBA program that say, I succeed, my grandfather succeed, he paid my tuition. That's not the way he saw it. And that's not the way he wanted to teach me. So with my grandfather, I learned that foundational value the communitarian value, the Ubuntu value, the fact that 
He was because his people were. And I had to learn how to appreciate that I was because my grandfather was. He did not reject me. He did not reject my gift. So when I went back the second time to say goodbye, what did I do? On the advice of my grandmother, now I bought, and this was my running out of money, I bought two bottles of snap. I bought two bottles of snap. When I showed up to say good morning, or goodbye, which is what I, I did, I passed through the living room, I went to the bedroom, I left one bottle of snap in the bedroom, and I brought the second bottle of snap out and gave it to my grandfather. And what did my grandfather do? He opened that snap and did the same thing he did with the other snap that I talked about. But now my grandfather knew he had another bottle in the bedroom. And my grandfather was just as happy as he could be. And the same entourage was even happier for having seen two bottles of snap within two weeks. And he did his libation. My wife and I left. I was happy. My grandfather couldn't have been more happy. And the people around him were happiest. And so I solved my problem. My father, my grandfather escorted me to the gate. And that was where they took the picture with my wife. He was happy. I had solved a problem. Now I learned some values. And I experienced joy. And my grandfather had taught me a lesson that I never forgot. Now, I'm sure you got the point. I go to the second foundational stone, stepping stone. Now, the lady you're seeing there is my wife's grandmother. My wife's grandmother. An important stepping stone. Now, I'm, I, my wife doesn't, she's surprised. She's seen the uh, picture of her grandmother. But let me explain to you. This grandmother is a daughter of a slave. I mean, she, she gave the parents where people were slave. She's, that's what she was. And she grew up in Sanford in North Carolina, Lee County. But when I went, met my Bernice, and we decided to visit her little town, Sanford, North Carolina. Grandma was one of the people that I met. Now, if you talk to her family, she had a reputation for being the best ironer in Lee County. White folks all over Lee County took their clothes to grandma to iron. She was the best iron. That's what people knew her to be. That's what I was told. And I appreciated that. Grandma was also another thing. She wrote poetry. She could have been ghetto style. When she read her poetry in church, the crowd was mesmerized. She wrote poetry. But nobody knew grandma for being a poet. I went to church. I heard her recite her poetry. I was just mesmerized. But you'll be surprised. That's not what grandma 
represented to me as my stepping stone. When I went there the first time with Bernice, I did not sleep in her parents' house. I went over to sleep with grandma. And grandma put me in the bed and put one of the skills. I don't know where any one of you been to the side. That thing covered me. I thought she didn't mean for me to sneak out to find her God. That thing was so heavy, I couldn't turn. <laughs> and, but I went to spend the night with grandma. And grandma couldn't cook. She, she was a bad cook. It's simply because I guess her daughter-in-law my wife's mother was a great cook. With that story, I can relate at some point. So nobody really thought about grandma as the person who I was going to the house with. But while we sat there in the evening talking, grandma turned to me and she would call me Bill and laugh. Grandma would say Bill and laugh. She asked me a very simple question. It wasn't even a question. She said, Bill, is this come see or come stay? Now, I don't know what you all would interpret with that question. But grandma said, Bill, is this come see or come stay? And she had a smile on her face. It startled me. I didn't know how to answer the question. Believe me, I'd been in the country when I came to the United States. I went to the Center for Intercultural Understanding in Putney, Vermont. I had stayed over in, with my host parents. Uh, my host brother is there. And I got there on August 2nd, 1966. I stayed with them uh, six weeks or so before I went to Duke. I'd been at Duke. And folks, I understood what it meant to play the field. Now all of you know what it meant to play the field. I was a young man developing tremendous capacity on how to play the field. I had my Mustang and, uh, and then I had a girlfriend. She was gracious enough to allow me to travel with her to six Hello to her parents. And then I go there and grandma says, is this come see or come stay? I thought about this. And while I was being startled, grandma said, my little young brother, the brother of my girlfriend at the time, he said, Ronnie, you go around the corner and get a little nip for us. And uh, that little young man took me around the corner. We got into this little house next door, and I bought a bottle of moonshine. And I brought it back, and grandma and I started drinking some moonshine. I, I became a little loose, and I started having a discussion with grandma. And we went on that evening. Now, For those of you that need translation, <laughs> grandma was asking me, are you here playing the field or do you plan to settle down with my lovely granddaughter? She didn't ask it that way. She asked it very simply, is this come see or come stay? Now, Foundational value number two. What did I get out of this experience? I got to find out that grandma was trying to get across to me the value of intentionality. She was asking, what are your intentions? Now, all of us know, if you've been following justice, the only time we get from assault to 
murder where you, they charge you with death, is when the jury is able to think and accept that there was intentions. If they cannot get to intentions for killing somebody, you cannot be charged with first degree murder. Yeah, you, all of us know that. Now, grandma is trying to get my intentions for her granddaughter. And she asked it in a nice, jovial way. I didn't quite get it, but I finally got it. And I don't know whether that's the reason we've been married 55 years, but grandma grounded me in terms of intentionality. I didn't stop playing the field right away, don't get me wrong. But every time we went down to Sanford and grandma looked at me, I let her know I'm come stay, not come see. And grandma had some other ways of expressing this. I had a motorcycle, I always rode a motorcycle. My dear wife here would not even get on my motorcycle back in 1960. Guess who rode the motorcycle? Grandma. Grandma got on back of my grand on my motorcycle and we vanished into the woods of Sanford and we came back one hour later on when everybody had almost become drunk because they were wondering where grandma and I would end up. So grandma was a lot of things, but the foundational value that I learned from grandma was intentionality. When I went to do all of these doctorate degrees and social ethics, I read books about intentionality. I have authors and books that I can quote for you. But grandma had a way of teaching intentionality with few words. And it came through and came through properly. Now, that's the family that developed as a result of grandma's intentionality. Now, let me go on to another value. The educational path, which started at Duke, came to Pitt, went to USC, and then, of course, I was involved in activism, which we'll deal with later on. These are the students who decided to join me to go into the black communities to talk to black business people. And it wasn't about teaching accounting and inventory control. It was about establishing relationships that we never had. And I found out later on that when this group of students joined me and we went up to the Hill District and Morris' father was in the Hill District running the Morris Fountain funeral. When we went there, that Zoffer, may his soul rest in peace, and Prosper called downtown to the chief of police down there. And he called to tell them that Tita and his, had taken white students from the cathedral up the hill, 10 minutes away, and they were worried about the lives of these white students. So could the chief of police do something about white students being up in the hill district? They were going to do another thing. They were going to buy what they call a blanket insurance policy. 
should anything happen to any of the students? Some of you know about those insurance policy during games or when you have a rally or something like that. Possible and so therefore we're going to buy a general insurance policy to cover those students. It wasn't about teacher, it was those students. And uh, we don't know where they ended up with the policy. None of us got hurt, none of us got killed. And, uh, but the, it is telling what happened. Now, I had all kinds of people through my educational trip at Duke, at Pitt, at USC. Now, when I came to Pitt. When I met William Tiga Tita, he had already given much thought to questions about standards of morality based on the circumstances that he had faced at such a young age. He was extremely eager to learn about the world of business as a newly minted engineer in training, EIT. At the time, corporations were largely about making as much money as possible with little regard for the community needs and interests. Tita's generation were increasingly growing restless and questioning the rightness of this orientation in the face of all the isms, racism, sexism, war, etc. B-schools were obliged and similarly oriented. It was quite a divide. Our guiding team consisted of many talented individuals, notably Norman Dixon, Ian Mitroff, Don Bowen, Dave Blake, and later Peter Drucker who was catalytic in the establishment of the USC Kent Fellowship Program to mint new ethicists on an accelerated basis. William Tiga Tita, his cohorts, and my guiding team worked tirelessly to embrace the emerging concept of corporate responsibility. Pitt quickly became the intellectual epicenter of this movement. The dream was to have Pitt as the pasture land, the greenhouse, so to speak for fostering this concept, CSR1, CSR2, CSR3, ECTT, on a global basis. The idea, born a decade and a half earlier, had taken roots at Pitt, needing just further nurturing for its development and testing on a global basis. Today, we simply wish to take stock and ask what happened Now, Bill Frederick, our mentor, our conceptualizer in this movement of corporate social responsibility speaks to us. I was his student. As a matter of fact, I think I was his favorite student. When we had our first child, our daughter, at McGee Hospital, Bill Frederick was the first one to show up with a bouquet of flowers. I had 50 cents in my pocket. But he came up with a bouquet of flowers, so I handed it over to my wife at McGee Hospital. That was important. So he walked the talk, but he never, never handheld us and tell us what to think or how to think. He only articulated what had started in 1954, but had crystallized in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh was the epicenter of the corporate social responsibility movement. No questions about it. So, Bill Frederick became the father of CSR. For those of you who wonder what CSR means, it means corporate social responsibility. And there's corporate social responsibility one, and there's corporate social responsibility two, and there's corporate social responsibility three, 
and there's corporate social responsibility for and so on and so forth. Now, corporate social responsibility three is not is not corporate social responsibility. It stands for corporate social rectitude. And uh, so for those of you that wish to read on it, you'll find out that CSR1, CSR2 is different from CSR3. But we learn these things. He was the conceptualizer. And he resonated with us because he was speaking what we thought, how we felt. And that was important for a lot of us. Howard Bowen started this in 1954. Martin Luther King, a theological revolutionary, uh, continued preaching the same gospel. Nelson Mandela preached the same gospel. Gandhi preached the same gospel. Kofi Annan preach the same gospel. And I want to let you know, I did meet Martin Luther King, 64, when I went to Duke, or 66. I did meet Mandela when I was at the UN. I delivered the rewritten constitution of South Africa to him personally. And I never met Gandhi. I read about him. But Kofi Annan, was my boss. I worked with Kofi Annan until he died a few years back. And he preached the same kind of gospel. Kofi Annan, by the way, was the Secretary General of the UN. All of these people were talking about the responsibility of business to the community. Now, I talk Being about the president and CEO of Bank of America, the world's biggest, I was committed to continuing the tradition of community engagement. The bank, like the rest of the business community, was challenged with several social issues that were becoming front burner issues. And business was largely seen as a principal perpetrator. A Latin American economic meltdown was highly impactful on Bank of America as well. There were, however, several invisible ethical crises that Bill Frederick's team brought to my attention. I volunteered as William Tiga Tita's guinea pig during his formation as a professional ethicist. So that's what I did. I took the theory of corporate responsibility and tried to make it a practice. Although we worked tirelessly on this issue, it wasn't my only focus. Family is important to me and spending time building a relationship with William and his daughter, Nijo, during our off-site 10-day retreat was equally as significant. Just to mention, Tom, we call him, this, in 1979, was the CEO, president of Bank of America. It was the largest bank in the world multi-billion dollars. And Tom volunteered as my guinea pig to study with me and to recommend to his board an ethical issue that we had identified. And uh, for me to earn my tips as a Kent Fellow in social ethics. Tom chose Catalina Island as our venue for the 10 days that we were going to <clears throat> be together. He brought himself to Catalina Island in the yak. My daughter and I flew over to the Catalina Island. When we got there, just like the intercultural house experiment, the rule was Tom and I had to stay in a motel room, not no risk. We had to stay in a hotel room. So we got into the motel, and there was a bunk bed. And then, of course, I had brought my daughter, Najo. And so we had to decide very quickly who was going to sleep at the top and who was going to sleep at the bottom. 
And while I was trying to defer to Tom, who was chairman, president of Bank of America, I was awed by this man. He quickly dispelled the notion that we were different. And he said, Tita, we don't need to flip the coin. I'm going to sleep on the, the bed below. And the reason I'm going to sleep the bed below is that I am a family man. I read stories to my grandkids. So my responsibility is at, in the evening, I would read the story to Nigel. And when she goes to sleep, you and I go out and have a little cocktail and continue our discussion. And that's what Tom did. He read the story to Nigel. Nigel went to sleep. And he and I stepped out to continue our discussion on ethical things. And Tom, you may know, was CEO, chairman of Bank of America. He was Italian. Bank of America is always known to be, was an Italian bank, but it has grown and had become the biggest bank in the world. And they had their problems. But I'm not here to talk about the problems. Talking, talking about Tom, who was a human being that wanted to teach me one or two values. His value was that he was a family man. And he wanted me to understand what family values constituted. And so he slept with me in a motel for 10 days. We discussed all kinds of ethical issues. But at the end of the day, he left me with that understanding that family is important. Now, having gone through that experience, This is Nigel. Nigel has grown. She is the chief marketing officer for a $70 billion company owned by an Italian family. Now, most of you may not even know this company, but it's a $70 billion company. They own pet care, for those of you that like dogs and cats. They own the confectionaries, and they own like 87% of all the veterinary hospitals in the US and around the world. Now, she's grown to become the chief marketing officer, chief branding officer. And needless to mention, her association with Tom, the Italian values that Tom was trying to bring to bear in 1979 has paid off 50 years later on. So when that family that owns Mars talk to Nigel, they have a feeling that she has some kind of Italian DNA. There's no question about that. But she traveled that journey. She's where she is right now. And I reflect on Tom as a stepping stone. I reflect on the value Tom was trying to teach me. And I also you know, reflect on the sacrifice that Tom made for spending 10 days of the CEO president's time with me in the Catalina Island. And what did we talk about? We talked about everything. And for that, I am extremely appreciative. I would only <laughs> try to end this discussion. For those of you that are pursuing MBAs, for those of you that already have MBAs, 
MBA is an important degree to have. It was important in 1969, it's important in 2024. And it has helped me individually, in cooperation, international area. It's catalytic. Some of you know about those of, those of you that bake bread, put the dough together and put a little yeast in it and it blows. That's what the MBA does. It's a yeast. It blows whatever context that you are in. Individually, my teaching career, my entrepreneurial career, my corporate career, my international career have all benefited from having gone through the MBA program with my eyes open. I got to get most of what benefited me after, not even during the time I was going through the MBA program. And I only ask for those of you that are going through the, through the learning process, keep your eyes open on the stepping stones. Keep your eyes open on people that are trying to tell you something that you don't think you understand. Because at the end of the day, you would find out about it, and I hope not too late, but you'll find out about it and it can help shape you in the present and in the future. Now, I want to end by saying we came to Pitt, we learned corporate social responsibility, some of us left and went to corporations and so on. But I got to tell you something. There was one elephant in the room that most of us never actually understood. I would also say my mentor, <laughs> my conceptualizer, Bill Frederick, he didn't put any emphasis on this. And that's the three Ps, profit, people, planet. He talked about profit. He talked about people. But planet Earth wasn't part of our vocabulary when we were doing the MBA. Now, planet Earth these days is known as climate change. Some of you know about climate change. When we came to Pittsburgh in 1969, the stacks, smoke stacks, were up here. Before we came, you couldn't wear a white shirt from morning to evening. But when we came here, we all smelled the smoke stacks. But we did not talk about it. And we did everything, and they cleaned it up, took the smoke stacks down, and formed the technology corridor and all that. But what we did not know, folks, was that the smokestacks was what you saw. What you did not see was the carbon monoxide and the, all those things that were going into the water and going to the ground and filtering the atmosphere that have become the root cause of cancer, the root cause of climate change, the root cause of sustainability in the world, you cannot see with the eyes. Some of us know that there's so much carbon that, that the earth can hold and so on, it's saturated, so it's going down, the earth cannot absorb it. But sustainability is not something we were taught or we know anything about. But it is climate change and we're not taking it for granted. That is the area that I hope younger folks can get to be serious about. That is the area that is affecting all of us, black, white, Japanese, Chinese, Africans, I don't care who you are. That's the area that we have to deal with. And so, folks, 
I will not want to belabor the point. I have 23 foundational values. I have 18. And you all sitting here can add another 50. But that's not the point. The point is we all have stepping stones. We got all have le lessons to learn. And we all have to shape a future that is consistent with what we believe is right. We've tried a few things. The Bill Friendly that I'm talking about, we want to honor him, we want to keep him. Under the leadership of Rich here, we've created a little fund to keep the memory and the legacy of Bill Frederick alive. We couldn't establish a professorship yet, so there is a speakership program that has been in place, and the first speaker in that series will be around in March. Rich, when? Okay, she's coming from Boston, right? Um, Kennedy School of Government. Okay, well, whatever. We have, we have a Bill Frederick speaker series that is going to jump out in March. Those of you that are here, please make sure you participate in that speaker series because it keeps hope alive. It keeps this discussion alive. And uh, it is something that we have to live with. I've learned my lessons. I would move with what I think I've learned. I want to thank you. I want to give honor to all of those people and those of you that are sitting here who were part of it. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Olson here, Joe Olson. She was a young professor, <laughs> a very young professor. And she taught one of those courses called Macro Macroeconomics. And you can tell Tito is not into micro macroeconomics. Clarence and the rest of the people understood what she was talking about. I appreciated what she was talking about. Well, Joe, thank you for being around. She just recently retired. And uh, we are most, most grateful uh, for your support then, now, and in the future. The rest of you, again, thanks for coming. Appreciate you. And Paul, keep hope alive. I made a joke last night about being Bill's timekeeper. <laughs> so you see how efficient I was in doing that. So I'll leave it to Paul to right. figure out how we're going to handle the rest of this. All right. Well, we're, we're at time for this session. I, I want to uh, thank you as we close this session off, and particularly for those who joined us online. We will re reconvene right here at 145. Uh, there will be dis a discussion of the art of diplomacy. Uh, where we'll actually deal with uh, some additional storytelling uh, around uh, Dr. Tita's experience uh, within the diplomatic services. Uh, and that'll be actually moderated by Professor Julia Santucci, uh, who was um, the leader of the uh, or the director of the Center for Responsible Leadership uh, in Gispia. And so we'll reconvene here at 145. Thank you very much. <laughs>